Hi, everybody. It's week 11 of ENM 2020. Um, we are now jumping um, into the, the area of occurrence data. And so we started off this section with an overview from me, some theory from Jorge Soberon, and the talk on sources from John Wichorek. And joining me right now, we have John Wichorek from Argentina and Mona Papage from Tennessee. They're not from those countries or those places, but that's where they live. So they are joining us from there. Um, and I'm in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, so here I'm going to share my screen and just orient you guys a bit to the course. Um, let's see, there is the course plan. We are in the week of March 23rd, and there are the three talks we've just had. Next week, for next week, we will have, uh-oh, georeferencing from Mona. Um, a simple view of occurrence data cleaning from me, and then some automated tools for data cleaning from Tomer Guetta from Israel. So uh, we're, we're jumping into this, and uh, I hope that everybody is not only uh, paying attention to the lectures, but also trying out the tools as specific tools get, get uh, mentioned in the course. Um, okay, let's go into questions. So here is the list of questions. Um, John, you're the star of the show. Where do you want me to start? Um, there was one that was specifically meant for me. The number on that was, was 1651. And it's an easy one. An easy one. There you go. It continues that uh, I work with both legacy occurrences without coordinates and modern occurrences with primary georeferences. The answer is that um, there the best practices for georeferencing that was published in 2006, as well as the georeferencing quick reference guide, as well as the georeferencing calculator and its manual are all being revised under the auspices of GBIF as their most popular documents. And those are going to go out for public review within um, probably in early April. They're nearly finished. And I think maybe Mona can talk a bit about them in more detail than that. Because she's going to talk about georeferencing for a whole day. Hopefully not a whole day. <laughs> well, my, I my, it all day. <laughs> my, my previous talk was a uh, record one hour and 10 minutes or so. I'm trying not to, not to create yeah. another hour and 10 minutes uh, video. But yes, I will be covering uh, georeferencing manual, um, calculator, geolocate, so stay tuned, I guess. Just a comment about that. It's really, really good to see the question about good practices because the vast majority of data that are available to us for niche modeling, let's say via GBIF, uh, the vast majority either has a nice precise coordinate pair and no metadata or oftentimes just has no coordinates and both of those are pretty dodgy pretty uh, uncertain to use in niche modeling why well because you don't know whether that that point on a map that you can see very precisely on Google Earth, you don't know if that has an uncertainty of 10 meters or 10 kilometers or 10,000 kilometers. And so this may seem to be, you know, like if you work with birds, uh, there's half a billion records out there. 
just don't worry about it. Just, well, no, you need that precision and you need those metadata. And yes, they take a ton of time to add. Uh, John has been working with that for what, 20 years now, John? I hate to admit, yes. <laughs> but um, it is crucial scientific doc documentation of the data that we use as inputs. So this is really important stuff, whether you like it or not. There's a good follow-up on 1597. It takes it a little bit further, if you like. Okay, go ahead. It's a multi-part question. Um, the first bit of it, uh, number one, is when I'm filtering my data set of coordinates in GBIF, what flags do I need to select to get whose georeference? There's so many flags that, and, that they confuse me. Maybe Mona can go over this, I don't know. If, if you intend to, then we can skip that for the moment. Uh, I can, let's address the question and I can add um, slides so that there is, there is some material. Okay, so then I'll answer it briefly. And that is, yes, it's, especially in terms of geography, there are lots of flags in the GBIF interpreted data. Many of them are just flags to tell you that they did something. They interpreted something in a particular way. So for example, they detected that the negative sign was missing for hemisphere based on the country and they flipped it for you. So you don't need to select a flag like that one if you trust their process. Uh, there are other ones in which they um, are interpreting the datum because it wasn't given or it wasn't something recognizable. If they do that and they don't account for the fact that that introduces a huge amount of uncertainty, kilometers in fact, that that is a suspect record. So you might not want those where they decided to just project it to WGS 84 when they didn't know. Um, that's basically the, the set of characteristics of those kinds of flags. Some of them are just saying what they did and other ones are saying uh, there's a serious problem here like the, the coordinates have been truncated or something like that. Now, there, so, are other, there are other quality flags like about taxonomy which yeah. also require attention, but we're kind of speaking geographically right now. Yeah. Number two is how can I know the uncertainties in my occurrence data download? This is an interesting one because the data for uncertainty are not shown in the user interfaces of GBIF. They are, however, available in the downloads if you choose the Darwin Core archive download because that one contains the verbatim original data and their coordinate uncertainties would come in only in verbatim original data. So that's what you have to choose. And, and that is, I think, and I have said uh, in reports to GBIF, that is a major problem. The update on that is yesterday, I was able to convince them to include uncertainties in the queries as well. Good. You'll be able to filter from the outset. Yeah. Because, you know, people, you got to think about those coordinates. You know, obviously, if you see a coordinate pair that's like, you know, 45 degrees north, 10 degrees west, with no decimals, you probably can guess that it's a pretty imprecise pair. Mm -hmm. But you might see a beautifully precise coordinate pair that you know has six or seven decimal points and decimal places and, and looks like a very specific place on the surface of the earth, but that may represent the centroid of the state or the country. And, and in fact, there are lots and lots of records in GBIF that are um, centroids of administrative units or centroids of atlas blocks. And so you can very quickly and very easily include 
data in your analyses that have no relationship to where the species is on the spatial resolution of your environmental data. So yeah, John, ideally being able to say, I only wanna see the coordinates that are precise to one kilometer or finer, perfect. But also I wanna see, you know, how many points are there with no uncertainty information or with 10 kilometer um, uncertainty? I mean, we need to see not just that, but all the other metadata fields to be able to make intelligent decisions about how to use the data that we have available to us. Yeah, in one of my slides, I had statistics on that across all of GBIF, and there are 44, no, 47.7% of the records, at least a year ago, that have coordinates but have no uncertainty information. Even, even eBird, for example, collects no metadata on, um, on the coordinates, correct? Uh, metadata as in who did it and how and all that sort of As in, um, you know, no. GPS versus... They do, do have uncertainty. Sorry, say again. Right. Uh, I don't think they do. I don't think they, they say anything about the sources of the coordinates, but they do have a days that share that with Jeff. Okay. Another question to, to look at. I can't resist. Um, I haven't harped on this as much this course, but I talked about this quite a bit in the last course. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. First of all, it's not an environmental niche model. It's an ecological niche model. Um, I know that sounds pedantic, but the history of this little field or this tool has been rife with imprecise and uncareful use of, of terminology. So let's, let's use ENM properly. Um, is there a minimum number of occurrences necessary? No, there is not a minimum number. Um, there is no statement and there should be no statement. I know I've published a couple course, a couple papers over the years um, looking at the influence of sample size on niche model quality. But to be very honest with you, um, some species can be characterized with very few points and some species cannot be characterized with very many points. It depends on the tools as well. Depends on the tools, it depends on the species, it depends on the landscape. Um, so no, there is no answer to that question. Can, can we also address the one above, um, above the one that he just addressed? The data from different years, which we talked about, I'm pretty sure we talked about when we had the, uh, when we discussed environmental data, but I see this almost on a weekly basis in interacting with grad students or, or other you know, faculty researchers, um, it's a crucial point to try to match, not try, to match temporally occurrence data to your environmental data, climatic data, whatever you're using. And I, I, there's so much resistance that I get uh, <laughs> when I explain you cannot use land cover from 2016 with occurrence data from the 1950s to the 1990s. Um, and there's no, I, I just don't know how else to put this, but yes, we have to match temporally where, when the occurrence data uh, were collected to what kind of environmental variables or predictors we are associating uh, with those uh, occurrences. I don't know if you find this often, Town or John or Marlon. <laughs> All the time. Um, now that's that's an advantage of climate data, because climate is defined as kind of the average of conditions over a relatively long period of time, might be thirty years or fifty years, and so you kind of have more 
opportunity to accumulate um, occurrence data during that time period. But if you're going to use uh, a very time specific um, environmental data layer like land cover or remotely sensed data, then your occurrence data have to key to that pretty well. Yeah, and in this case, this question is asking about whether to use uh, year or years, um, mean values. Um, I think this particular question is also, it relates to what you said, Tal, that if we are after climate, three years of data from 2016 to 2019 doesn't cut it. So Definitely. we are, yeah, we are at that point, you are modeling maybe population dynamics, three years of data, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's, it's hard <laughs> to explain that ecological niche modeling has to do with long, uh, you know, multi-generation, we are looking, I mean, uh, Jorge had in his presentation, sink population, source population, that, uh, that issue of, you know, you know, where are occurrence data coming from? Are we modeling sinks or source populations? That's why we need long-term data. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really hard to say you're, you are building an ecological niche model with three years of data. But I know that a lot of students and researchers want to use their data um, that they collected in the field. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we're talking about essentially a, the, I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to misuse the word, but perception of the environmental landscape by a species or a population. And there are certainly biological phenomena that happen on short time scales, like emergence of mosquitoes. Okay, um, but we're al also talking about long-term persistence of the population of that species across a landscape. And so, yeah, three years is nothing in that sense. And, um, and about the question of if using mean values of data, I mean, mean values of environments and stuff like that, I guess that depends not only in like the temporality of your data, but also on the like how seasonal the region of interest is. Uh, if you know that the species is in an area during only the spring and summer, then you probably don't have to use the animal means. But if the species is there the whole time, then you're more like so you're safe using those kind of variables. Yeah, very, very important, yeah. So there were a bunch of questions about sink populations and uh, Jorge's not here, but I can, I can give just a, a quick point about that. One question was, let's see, right here above this one. Um, is it possible to know whether an occurrence belongs to a source or a sink population? Well, it depends on the quality of your data. Uh, if you have data that are just, uh, I saw species X on day Y at place Z, then no. If you have um, repeat census data, uh, kind of like the, the breeding bird survey or something like that, you can at least get at the permanency of the population. But really, to get at whether a population is a sink or a source, you really need information on, on the reproduction and recruitment uh, within the population, because sink is basically defined as a presence of a species where the, the reproductive rates and recruitment rates are not sufficient to maintain a population. So it's essentially a, a, a presence that is maintained by immigrational subsidy. And so you need pretty high quality data um, to be able to know that in advance. What other questions, guys? There is a question about, um, so line above where you're right now, line uh, 16021, 1602, I guess. 
can how can someone deal with the problem of undersampling or oversampling in certain areas? Should said areas be excluded from the study? I think you're going to discuss this in the uh, next, not not after georeferencing. I think because I saw you have filtering, um, but yeah, maybe it's not the right time to uh, address this question. Maybe come back to it. Yeah, I mean we're we're going to talk about this. A uh, very brief answer to this is that. Some algorithms give us the potential for building uh, biased surfaces or, or surfaces that, that um, summarize the sampling that went into the, um, the, the data that we are using. Um, those approaches, at least in my experience personally, those approaches sometimes work, sometimes don't. Um, and so I usually try out a bunch of different approaches and create some tests to decide which is working best for that particular application. Other questions? I have one at 1,658. Another multi question. There we go. So the first one asks about citizen science apps like iNaturalist, that they could be important sources of information. And because they do have some level of verification uh, for some species, that might be just fine. Um, but it says we have no way of knowing the uncertainty estimate of the points, or do we? And the answer is yes, we do. iNaturalist does include uncertainties. Mm -hmm. But then there's the second part of the question that is, supposing we didn't have those uncertainties, uh, would a smartphone's GPS error be minimized? The answer there is a mixed bag. The accuracy of the GPS is probably quite high. These days it's 10 meters and under usually. The problem is if your GPS is configured to use a datum that is not the one you're mapping with or doing analysis with, and you just introduced error up to five and a half kilometers somewhere on the planet. That's ridiculously bad. So without knowing that information, and it is possible to have your smartphone give you coordinates in other than WGS84, if it's not given and explicit, the answer is no, you can't use it. I guess the second one is similar, right? That if you have data, whether it's on invasive species or not, how could you use data from different sources? One that contains uncertainty estimates from the records and one that doesn't. Is it possible? Well, others can give their opinions. I would say no. The ones without uncertainties are not usable. I think I might be a little gentler than that, um, but I certainly see your point. What I would do is I would create kind of a highest quality model that has only the data for which I'm, I have the uncertainty information. And I know a lot about those data. And then I might create a second model that uses more points. And my question is, would they be different? Right? So I don't, I mean, obviously I'm going to put the most confidence in the model that has the highest quality data, but oftentimes by doing that filtering down to, you know, just the things that have an uncertainty measurement, you know, of a kilometer or finer, I may also reduce my sample size or I may lose important sampling from certain regions or certain environments. But I'm by no means disagreeing with you, John, but I would encourage um, people doing niche models not to just do a single model, but rather to do suites of models that, that take into account some of these tough decisions that we have. Okay, I think I can agree that you should not do this naively. <laughs> yes. For example, there are areas where the environment does not change in a fairly large scale. So those you could use. Um, with a bit more confidence, but 
in a mountainous area, any place where the gradients of the, the environment are high, it's a high risk. Yes, without a doubt. So, you know, this is one thing that I've kind of uh, screamed at over the years, but over and over again in the development of the, the occurrence data portals, over and over again, we've seen the temptation to go ahead and just implement an automated niche model that just sits there on the occurrence data portal and generates niche models for people to look at or maybe even to use. And that is something that I just hate. Okay, GBIF had one for a while. Other portals have had them for a while. I don't think Vertnet ever did that, but, um, no. but it's a temptation because it's very kind of pleasing in that literally as you're browsing the data, you're seeing the interpolation. And there was always the comment of, you know, well, this way we make the biodiversity data more accessible to decision makers and, and policy makers. No, you're giving them bad information. You're giving them information that's based on simple, let's just say ignorant niche models that basically you're just picking up on some general correlation between occurrence and environment. It's essentially saying that all of the detail and all of the interesting content that we're gonna talk about in the six months of this course is unnecessary. I disagree. It's also, I mean, I have had cases in which when I'm gathering information and checking out the uncertainty, uh, you just, for some species, there's just not such information and or there is just for very few cases even though you have like plenty of occurrences in the database and i think that then is when it becomes more and more important to have the help of the expert in of experts in the group and i mean those people who they have dedicated their lives to studying certain species and they know where they are and they know if some records may be more or less wrong as well. I think that will be an option for some people like me that sometimes just there's no uncertainty level in the records you're gathering. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who has published on everything from viruses to ancient humans, um, my biggest mistakes or my biggest worries are associated with situations in which I would, was not working with the expert as a close colleague and as a, kind of a crucial component of the team. When the expert is there, you have, as Marlon said, the possibility of, of realizing, oh, no, 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 that's a mistake or this is silly. Uh, and when you don't have the expert there, you often end up trusting the data, and that can be that can be dangerous. And that's that's also a case of um, many papers today uh, nowadays, not today in the last five ten years. I don't know. Um, many papers focus on hundreds of species, you know, large scale analysis, multi species, maybe prioritization. Uh, um, area prioritization for conservation uh, in those situations when we when you know researchers work with uh, anywhere between I don't know 50 and more species uh, the that experience check doesn't happen and down you mentioned the these uh, workflows where it's all um, it's all done for you. <laughs> the data download, the data cleaning, uh, everything is done for you. Uh, that's where, yeah, we just we just automate automate the most uh, important part or one of the important parts of ecological niche modeling, which is looking at your data and understanding, seeing see if it makes sense for the organisms you're uh, you're uh, studying. Um, 
I think related to that, the question in uh, 1660, uh, line 1660, it says, do you guys find that people new to this field normally overlook the importance of a clean occurrence data to work with in ENM? I would say it's not just new people, it's a lot of people because we do this, right? We go on GBIF or we, we do our GBIF and download and clean uh, data uh, automatically. Um, and, but that automatic cleaning can be, uh, are the records, do the records have latitude, longitude? Great, I'm gonna use them. But Dawn, you mentioned that you can have latitude and longitude at the degree uh, precision. So 49 degrees north and I don't know, minus 85 degrees uh, or 85 degrees west, and that's it. And that can end up in a model. So I think, and especially Marlon, you mentioned the, um, the lack of uncertainty uh, in many, for, uh, associated with many records. That is almost always, I would say, working with students, almost always overlooked. And it's really hard to <laughs> convince the students or my colleagues to spend time cleaning the data set. And again, when we have large, when we have multi-species uh, analysis, we are just gonna run with whatever, you know, GBIF or uh, whichever source of data we are using is providing us. If it has coordinates, I'm using it. If it doesn't have coordinates, which is another gripe I have, another <laughs> long, <laughs> a long standing battle, if a, if a locality, if a record doesn't have coordinates, it immediately gets kicked out of the data set. But then you look at the record and it's perfectly fine. Like John said, a lot of GB for currencies don't have, have not been georeferenced. So what you have to do is spend time georeferencing that perfectly fine record that has a locality description that can be uh, georeferenced. So anyways, that's my rant for now. So I was just about to follow up on, on your comment with a comment saying that beware that many of the data portals kind of clean up the visual so that you are more comfortable with, with using the data. And I was going to pull up GBIF for any particular country and show that it was that all of the points fell very nicely in that country. And it appears that GBIF has pulled that off. I've never, I haven't seen this like this in a while. But those are the data records that correspond to Spain. And you can see a huge number of records in Spain proper, right? And you can see, but you can also see that there are a lot of records scattered around and actually love it that this is now visible on GBIF. Bravo GBIF, because this is honest presentation. And one of the questions was, how do I know how much uncertainty there is in my data? Well, this is one way. You look at the data and you see how dirty they are. So for example, a few years ago, John and I were in Ghana and we had one free day. Uh, I wasn't feeling that well, but but John got out and, and got around the city a bit and our hosts asked him, uh, where would you like to go? And he wanted to go to the beach. And I suspect there was some beach volleyball interest in there, but also what John wanted to do was to swim as close as he could get to this place. Remember this, John? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and that place is the best sampled place on earth. It, is, it has the coordinates zero, zero. <laughs> okay. Has nothing to do with reality. There's probably just open ocean there. But what there is there is all of the uh, silly georeferencing where one says, oh, I don't know. So as a symbol of not knowing, <laughs> I'm going to put zero, zero. Okay. Databases do it as well. They do it for you. In exactly. the absence of a value, they'll put a zero. Exactly. 
So you can see this stripe of occurrences right here. That's where there was a zero latitude value, but maybe a real longitude value. And there's <clears throat> indication of a stripe there that you can't see as well. But you can also then, for this query, which is Spain, you see this smear, which is probably real Spanish latitude values, and then mistakes for, for longitude. Let's try some other country. This, I'm, I'm actually really jazzed that, um, that we're seeing this because what GBIF had done for years was to mask and essentially show you only the points that were within the territorial limits of the country. So bravo GBIF, I love this. Yeah, I have not seen this, this is really cool. Now, anybody know what this is? This is really cool. This is one of that my is positive things. instead of negative. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's what happens when you forget that the Western Hemisphere has negative longitude, and so you get a mirror of your country on the other side of the world. And of course, we're seeing our zero zero, John's favorite swimming place. How about this? And it's this. It's like a constant, oh gosh, that, what is that? <laughs> Latitude <laughs> equals longitude. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> so what you get with a truly um, error-ridden data set is a cross, which is where the longitude was zero by accident, and where the latitude was zero by accident, and you get an X where either longitude got duplicated or latitude got duplicated. You get these kind of random errors of, you know, God knows why there's a, you know, a point in Northern Canada from Mexico. Uh, you get the mirror image of the country on the other side of the world. Now you can just, you know, forget about these errors, right? And look, if I do this, it looks like I have a ton of data from Mexico, and I do have a ton of data from Mexico. But I also have a ton of garbage. And I have to be very, very careful about how much of that garbage I allow to get into my models. And you know, some of that some of that can be rescued. Uh, I wonder if, you know, records from records in Canada, some, not, it's not easily rescuable, meaning that it's not, you know, latitude, longitude flipped or, or forgot to put the negative sign for longitude. But if there's a locality description, you can, you know, re-georeference that and fix, especially when you have, you know, only 30 occurrences, people, um, should be only 30 occurrences with lat long and usable lat long. Uh, people can still rescue some of those, fix the, the errors. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. Um, look at this map. This is for one species. This is more the sort of query that we would do um, for a niche model, okay? This is a species that I studied for my doctoral dissertation. And, you know, this is a lot more data than we had years ago when I was studying this. But this is a species that's only in cloud forest. And so it's going to be kind of in this little string and here and here, and then on a few montane areas in Central America. Um, this is an isolated population that should be considered a separate species. Um, but then look at these outliers, okay? I know as somebody who spent a lot of time with this species, I know for sure that those are wrong. But I may be desperate enough for occurrence data for this species that it's worth going and looking at that record and finding out you know, maybe it has a detailed locality descriptor in text that's detailed enough that I can figure out where it's from. 
So yeah, Mona, you're right on that, you know, many times, not only do we, you know, go in and clean out the garbage, but we may also wash the garbage and, you know, put it back in the pantry and use it. I used errors or <laughs> rescuing <laughs> your more direct garbage. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyhow, this is this I consider this really, really neat from GBIF that they're no longer kind of prettying up the data um, so that we're not offended by the data. Just for fun. <laughs> There's a little more. Those are lines in Alaska. In Alaska. Now, like some of these are true. Like that is the last remaining Asian lion population in Gujarat in India. Um, some of these are true but old. So I may be able to, and th these are some of the, the data cleaning things that, that we might do. Let's see. There is basis of record. Watch those points. I'm going to reduce this just to just to specimens and will you stop this? And see how the European points largely disappeared. Okay, so there's a ton of things that we have to do to explore our data and to understand what's going on in the data set. Some of these are zoos, some of these are errors, some of, some of these were, were probably sub-fossil occurrences or are zoos or errors. But then, you know, look carefully. Notice in West Africa, lions are only in Benin, it looks like. Okay, one in Ivory Coast. Well, is that true? Or is that detailed sampling in Benin and no sampling or at least no reporting in other countries? And so, also, yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, Fikir, uh, my, my former PhD student, would be very disappointed. <laughs> Ethiopia, <laughs> there are many more, uh, not many more, but a few more populations there. Exactly. So dealing with occurrence data is all about, yeah, the automated uh, problem flagging. And we're going to hear about some really neat new tools for that. But it's also about kind of sorting through your data by hand. And so I'm going to give, for Monday, I'm going to give a, a pretty old-fashioned um, play with your data and explore your data talk. Because if you're not doing that, I can pretty much guarantee you that some garbage is getting past you and into your niche map. Hey, Tom, before you change that screen, can I yep. comment on something? Yeah. Um, I was a bit worried about this too, and I checked in with GBIF while you were talking. The fact is that that capability to see the bad data has always been there, but it's something you can turn on and off. And on your screen at the bottom, there's a very fine print and it says, hide them. That's how you make them go away. Look at that. Let me, let me go back oh, to it. Probably view. was something set in, the, in your browser as a cookie since I don't know when. They've, they said they've had this for three years. And um, that since they changed how it appears recently, you, you might remember not too long ago, there were a bunch of hexagons and stuff. Yes and now they don't have that. So it might have changed when they changed that. But so I think what has changed then is the default. Maybe, or, or the cookie doesn't work anymore in your browser because it's a different cookie. Uh, I don't know. Let's see, boom. It'll come along in a moment. See that? Now let's go yeah. in. This is what I wanted to show you guys earlier because what I was gonna say is be careful that you know, here, here's the occurrence data corresponding to uh, the United Kingdom. 
And what you can see is this beautiful polygon, which is the, what, 200 mile territorial limits of, of, of Great Britain, of the United Kingdom. Um, and you can see, obviously, the density on land is incredible. But you can also see no occurrences elsewhere in the world. How do you how do you go back to the not hide it with you? I don't know. <laughs> no, I love it. I'm so sorry, people. Okay, oh, there you go. by getting rid of including co coordinates. Okay. Anyhow, the point is very simply that um, be conscious that every data set has error and every decision that you make or every decision you decide not to make has implications about whether error gets included in your niche model or not. Recently, I was like just taking the time that it takes me to do certain things. And I calculated that like checking the data, it takes from 10 to 20 times more than doing the models. Even doing like very, very strong calibration processes. So it, it should take that amount of time, Marlon. It doesn't always, yeah. which is to say, many people stick their head in the sand. You see, I'm being civilized. I said in the sand and um, ignore it. And they just allow a certain amount of bad quality data to get into their input data set. And then, you know, we get into a, a realm of what's called garbage in and garbage out. So, you know, one comment is anytime somebody says to you, we're automating niche modeling, your answer should be bullshit. Okay. I've had please somebody don't. say, huh? <laughs> or please don't. <laughs> oh, bullshit. <laughs> um, I've had somebody say to me, and a person of quite high repute in the biodiversity informatics world, I've had somebody say to me, let's just run a niche model for every species in GBIF, you know, the 1.8 million species that are, that are represented by some record in GBIF. And it's hilarious. Guess where the diversity center of life on Earth would be? Great Britain? No, zero, zero. Oh, Come on, John, this is your swimming hole. <laughs> oh, no. I, I should have realized it when I was there. <laughs> so, so, I didn't make crowded. it that far. <laughs> but literally, um, I've had people say to me, why don't we just do it? And the only answer is bullshit. Garbage <laughs> in, garbage out. Okay, Can I follow up on a quick one? Yeah, and I've only got a couple minutes because I have to teach at 10. Okay, I don't have to do one if you've got others that are important. No, one last one from you, John. Okay, 1673. It's a multi-part one. I can't answer uh, Jorge's question, but I can answer the one that's for me. Go ahead and read the question if you would. That way I don't have to switch it back. Okay. The one for me says, can occurrence data for a specific species be shared in multiple sources? That is, the same database of a species can be found in GBIF and in VertNet? The answer is, not only can the same record be found in multiple aggregators, for example, everything in VertNet, absolutely every single record in VertNet is also in GBIF. But also, within a given aggregator, there can be multiple instances of exactly the same biodiversity record. There are cases of fish that come from five different sources. So be aware of that. Yeah, that's another reason to clean your data. It's, it's to the point, not so much with, um, with VertNet, but if you go to the plant world, a very common thing among botanists is to cut, to collect duplicates. And duplicates would be, you know, I'm going to work in, you know, with the plants of Botswana or whatever. And from each tree, I, I collect, you know, five clips and press them. 
and then maybe I deposit one herbarium sheet in the herbarium in Botswana and one in my home institution, and maybe I send one to, I don't know, Kew Gardens. Well, those are from the same individual. But maybe Marlon, the expert in that group of plants, comes along and says, oh no, that is not that species. That is really this species. And so you can literally have the same individual organism in different databases under different names. Scary. That's kind of a, a scary feature that we don't really deal with. But uh, yeah, I mean, the neat thing, and this is thanks in part to John, um, in large part to John, Arwen Core is essentially a, an international standard for describing biodiversity data records. And it allows any Darwin Core record anywhere online to be grabbed up by an aggregator and made available. So explicitly, we do run into the same record in multiple places. OK, I'm afraid I do have to go. So um, thank you. Marlon, Mona, and John. Thanks, John, for the talk. And sure. thanks, everybody else, for tuning in. And we'll have some new videos up for you on Monday. And we'll see you all back um, on Friday. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks again.